السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام دكتور كان كيف حالك؟ اهلا وسهلا دكتور نانسي كيف الصحه ان شاء الله بخير؟ تمام تمام مشتاقين الله يخليك كيف الامور صارت احسن ان شاء الله؟ تمام الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين يلا هيك حظنا حلو حنشوف حضرتك مرتين بشكل قريب الله يخليك انا حظي الحلو تسلمي المحاضرة الثانية إن شاء الله حتكون يوم الاثنين إن شاء الله اللي هي تبع الكيميكال بيرنز إن شاء الله إن شاء الله احنا وي ستيل هاف 6 minutes يس تمام تقريبا تمام بعمل بس some touch ups اوكي نا دكتورة نبلش نحضر إن شاء الله لل more advanced second phase خلينا series إن شاء الله إن شاء الله بجهودكم إن شاء الله إسلموا الإيدين شكرا جزيلا بالعكس شكرا على الفرصة يعني إنه to be part of this platform إن شاء الله إنه في مجالات ناس كثير يعني I think نعم موضوعات عفوا سوري تفضلي تفضلي حضرتك لا لا انه الموضوعات كثير مهمه يعني عم بيجيني نعم. فيدباك انه كثير ناس عم تستفيد صراحه صح هذا الشيء اللي كنت رح اقوله و... وخاصه انه احنا مشينا معهم من البيزك نوعا ما وباتجاه الادفانس يس الناس متعطشه حقيقه لموضوع البيزك مثل ما هي متعطشه لموضوع الجراحه لانه احيانا انا بجوز ما اكون مثلا فرضا يعني سبيشاليتي تبعي بجوز ما تكون كورنيا انه والله انا اعمل ادفانسد كورنيا سيرجريز بس بنفس الوقت انا بالعياده تبعي انا ممكن اشوف كثير اشياء آه بدها بس بيزك مش اكثر يعني تمام ذاتس uh, كوركت حتى في كمان نعم في كمان يعني مرات الواحد بيكون كثير انشغل بالسبيشاليتي تاعته او بالهيز اون ورك في اشياء معينه بفكر انه احنا وصلنا لهذا الاند بوينت اوف تريتمنت وخلص سم تايمز اي اوبننج هذول المحاضرات انه يس اي كان ريفير يس اي كان دو سمثينج حتى طريقه الكونسلنج للمريض اختلفت انه والله في سمثينج ذات كان بي دون ف كروس ريفرنس بين سبيشالتيز كثير مهمه يعني مش ضروري يكون واحد سبيشالايز بشيء معين حتى بالسبيشالتي نفسها بتقدر تو يعني في ناس بتكون بجراحه معينه حتى في القرنيه فكثير مهم اي اوبننج صحيح هلا مثلا في الجلوكوما سيريس نوعا ما يعني صار فعلا اي اوبننج على كيف الواحد يقرا الفيجوال فيلد كيف يقرا الاو سي تي كيف يشوف الاوبتيك نيرف حتى تخيلي بس الاوبتيك نيرف بحد ذاته كمان هذا يعني كان سيشن فول سيشن ف 
صار حتى الواحد يعني لو انه بجوز بالمكان اللي عم يشتغل فيه بجوز ما يكون في جلوكوما سبيشالست او بال بالاريا كلها اللي عم يشتغل فيها ما يكون في جلوكوما سبيشالست وبالتالي هو صار بامكانه انه ياخذ قرار بشكل افضل لين ما انه ممكن يحول المريض ل ل سب سبيشاليتي بمكان اخر او باريا اخرى لا شك 100% دكتور محمد حسني رح يكون معنا اليوم انا ما انتبهت للايميلز كان عندي كراودينج شوي هيد انت ريبلاي هيد انت ريبلاي هيد انت ريبلاي نو اي نو كريستوفر ليو از جوينج تو راشا امم شفته على البوست اللي حطوه الحمد لله الدنيا هلا باك تو نورمال لايف الترابلز وال اولموست يس اه الحمد لله ولو انه هذا اصابنا شوي بالكسل وصار الواحد بيقول طيب ما اونلاين كله عم ينحل ليش لحتى الواحد يسافر يعني مثلا انا ما ما حروح على الاسكرز اه والله هو يعني مش كثير مفتوح حتى الفيزا يعني مش كثير مفتوحه حتى فيزا الاسكرز يعني مش يعني معظم اللي رايحين رايحين مقدمين توكس هيك اللي شفته يعني هو مرات او عندهم شنجن بالاصل في دينايل احنا كمان اه او معه يعني اوريدي يعني في دينايل شوي انه والله فتحت يعني هيك الواحد هيزيتنت برضه م. بس الحمد لله يعني everything is going back الحمد لله أنا عندي مشكلة إنه هاي الزوم سكرين عم بتغطي لي ال السلايدز مش عارفة كيف تمينيمايز المفروض بالفيو بس ما عم بفتح معي مش عارفة إذا حدا من حضرتك عملتي شير؟ عم تعملي شير حضرتك؟ لا لسه ما عملت آه. عمل شير إيه اعملي شير لحتى آه. تقدري تشوفي السلايدز أوكي تمام وي كان سي ناو اه ناطي على الويندو مش قادر اعمل له مينيمايز لحظه شوي تمام ام فاين هلا اه تمام مش الحال الحمد لله We have one minute, so we can proceed. Now we're back streaming. The topic, on the idea, is not easy. Yes. Yes. And I was surprised that this is my talk. I wasn't expecting it. Oh, really? Yes, I was surprised that this is my talk. Oh, really? Yes, I was surprised that this is my talk. Oh, really? Yes, I was surprised that this is my talk. Oh, really? Yes, I was surprised that this is my talk. Oh, really? Yes, I was surprised that this is my talk. to look into the patients, يعني, how we're managing them. تمام الله يعطيك العافية. الله يعافيك. Uh, so we can start. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome everybody to this session, uh, session number seven in the corneal series um, with uh, our eminent speaker, Dr. Nancy Raqad from Jordan. And uh, we missed her last time because of unforeseen circumstances. Um, we were supposed to learn from her last time the chemical burns, but we are going to learn the chemical burns just after three days from now on Monday. So uh, be with us. And uh, today uh, we will enjoy, of course, uh, listening to her uh, with a very interesting talk, My Waist Hurts. So the stage is yours, Dr. Nancy, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I'm happy to be back again. Uh, uh, today we're gonna be talking about um, a very important topic, uh, a topic that's overseen in, in, in ophthalmology, not only in uh, cornea. And the uh, title, My Waist Hurts, is very descriptive of, the, uh, of this uh, pathology or disease, and uh, the hallmark of this uh, problem is pain. Um, the second thing uh, uh, about peripheral corneal diseases is uh, not being a cornea, well, uh, no, it's hurt, it hurts, it's the periphery. And naming it periphery has a, a very important uh, indication because the periphery has uh, so many uh, properties that's different other than uh, the central uh, clear part of the cornea. Uh, the peripheral cornea between the central 50% and the margin. Uh, 
let's not forget that the margin or the limbus is highly vascularized. There is a, a, a vascularization vessels and lymphatics along with it. Uh, uh, so this margin or limbus is uh, adjacent to it. There are stem cells in the vicinity. Uh, there are Langerhans inflammatory cells. So any disorder that affects these uh, uh, or this uh, area affects the cornea uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, obvious way. Continuing to say, why is it peripheral? Now the blood vessels and lymphatics, they provide arm of the immune pathway. When, I, when we talk about immune, we're talking about cytokines, protoglycanase, collagenase enzymes, or the degradation enzymes or uh, the lytic enzymes that can be uh, secreted when inflammation pursues. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, concentration of Langerhans cells around the corneal periphery is more. There's more also concentration of complement uh, factors and uh, immunoglobulins, especially immunoglobulin uh, IgM, IgG, and IgA, and they are present in high concentration around the corneal periphery. So we can look at the corneal limbus as a reservoir, uh, as, as it is a reservoir of the stem cells, at the same time, it is a reservoir of uh, inflammation and inflammatory mediators. Um, we can classify uh, uh, peripheral cornea diseases into uh, two groups. And uh, I like to look at it uh, in two different uh, uh, views. First, limited ocular uh, causes and uh, systemic causes. Now, the ocular causes usually are not as prominent as the uh, systemic causes. We all look at PUK as a systemic uh, disease, but the ocular cause uh, cannot be overseen. Um, some cases, and we can also divide them into infectious or non infectious. As I know, the list is very long, and no one can just uh, memorize all the list of causes for uh, peripheral aesthetic keratitis. But it's important to catch at least um, 10 uh, causes from all the, the list of uh, ocular and non ocular. Um, ocular causes, um, the infectious causes uh, include the staphylococcal bacterial infections, streptococcus, uh, and when we talk about staph, we're talking about blepharitis. Blepharitis can uh, uh, initiate uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Uh, one of the very important causes of peripheral ulcerative keratitis is herpetic infection, and we're not talking about herpetic keratitis uh, in the stroma, we're talking about herpetic surface, uh, 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 herpetic epithelial uh, keratitis. Uh, the zoster is also uh, a very important uh, provocative for uh, um, yeah, peripheral ulcerative disease, uh, acanthamoeba keratitis, and fungal to a lesser extent. The most important infections to rule out in a patient who has uh, 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 peripheral ulcerative keratitis is the staphylococcus. So you look at the limbus, you look at the uh, eyelids, and you look at the margin, and you examine for any uh, kind of anterior blepharitis and you look for any signs of herpes zoster or herpetic infection. These are the most important to eliminate in a patient you're suspecting uh, uh, an infectious cause of uh, his PUK. Now, the non-infectious is a long list. Um, usually, we do not um, uh, uh, exclude uh, uh, the, the uh, systemic manifestations and go to the non-infectious ocular until the very end, uh, especially with the idiopathic. Um, acne rosacea can provoke it, but please remember that acne rosacea also causes blepharitis, and the blepharitis, uh, they do uh, uh, provoke uh, PUK. Uh, Morin's ulcer, I will discuss this later, a traumatic uh, or post-surgical, um, exposure, neuroplastic keratopathy, marginal keratitis, again, marginal keratitis can be um, a cause of uh, toxins produced by the staphylococcus from the lids, so we're going again into a circle from infectious causes, um, contact lens use because of the hypoxia and the injury and the microtrauma to the cornea and nutritional deficiencies. All these together, they lead to uh, a micro injury or trauma to the cornea and thus uh, uh, a triggering of the inflammatory cascade in the, uh, uh, around the limbus. And this is what causes the uh, peripheral ulcerative uh, keratitis. The systemic list is very long, and this is just a, a, a small a tip of the iceberg. But we can, again, say it's the systemic can be infectious or non-infectious. The infectious systemic manifestations are very, very rare. But one of the most important uh, infections, systemic infection that might provoke PUK is hepatitis C. So we have to keep in mind that hepatitis is uh, an important and prominent cause of uh, PUK in an otherwise non-diagnosed cause for PUK in a patient. 
Um, and the more uh, often is the non-infectious cause, uh, systemic cause of PUK, and we can uh, uh, divide them into a collagen vascular disease or vasculitis, and these are more important, more aggressive, and more commonly encountered. And we're talking about rheumatoid, uh, uh, vaginal granulomatosis, polyarthritis nodosa, uh, shark uh, straw syndrome, lapsing polychondritis, uh, lupus, uh, scleroderma, and giant cell arthritis. And as you can see, giant cell arthritis can cause PUK in two ways. Um, as a vasculitis, and this is usually associated with uh, necrotizing scleritis, or as a, an autoimmune uh, response to uh, uh, giant cell arthritis. So it, it, it uh, uh, provokes PUK in two, uh, in two ways. Uh, Jogrens, OCP, inflammatory bowel, Crohn's, sarcoid, all these also they play a role in as an infectious systemic uh, uh, or autoimmune uh, causes or association with uh, um, yeah, peripheral arthritis, arthritis. So um, the pathophysiology, to sum it up, is simply put um, an immune uh, mechanism. Whether it is a humoral and cell-mediated immunity involved, whether it is an autoimmune reaction to antigens in the cornea, whether it is a hypersensitivity to exogenous exposure, such as in the case of uh, marginal keratitis or staphylococcal blepharitis, or is it an immune complex deposition, all these they play in one direction, which is triggering an immune response in the vicinity around the corneal limbus and initiating the, uh, uh, the oozing of uh, uh, inflammatory mediators into the cornea. So why does the cornea ulcerate? The cornea ulcerates because of this inflammatory cascade that's been turned on. Um, and how, how uh, progressive and how aggressive is the inflammation that's occurring around the vicinity? Uh, this will determine how ugly will be the ulceration or the guttering or the undermining of the cornea. You see inflammatory cells invading, you see the blood vessels that were just pushed uh, 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 away uh, by the uh, uh, limbus stem cells uh, from the cornea just invading the limbus. You'll see the angry vessels, you'll see uh, hyperemic conjunctiva, and you'll see oozing of lytic enzymes that are activated. We're talking about collagenases and proteoglycanases. And uh, uh, they eat up the uh, attachments um, uh, in the corneal uh, desmosomes. And uh, the vessels and the lymphatics also will, uh, that are in close proximity, will bring in and, uh, the inflammatory cells, uh, neutrophils, and the, all the immune mediators, the cytokines, will uh, just assemble there. And the end result will be uh, uh, keratolysis of the uh, corneal stroma. It's very important to know it is keratolysis. So the cells, they just uh, die. They are necrotized. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, time goes by, the uh, ulcer or thinning uh, uh, ensues. So simply peripheral ulcerative keratitis is a destructive inflammatory response of the cornea. So if we know this for sure, I think this will uh, make any, any picture of peripheral ulcerative keratitis uh, uh, explainable to any uh, ophthalmologist. Um, and it's, let's say your uh, uh, main reason is not to diagnose which caused this, as long as you know this is an inflammatory destructive phenomena that has, be to, that has to be stopped as soon as possible. How do they present? They present in so many variable ways. They can uh, present according to the underlying uh, cause, of course. If it's an infection, they, become, they come with lacrimation, uh, red eye, pain, photophobia. You might see uh, infiltrate in the cornea. And you might not notice the uh, ulcerative keratitis until uh, later. Um, there might be hypopia, and these are the signs. Um, and uh, sometimes it might be very subtle. There might be very minimal pain. And the only thing is that the change in vision because of some uh, cells in the AC causing um, a blaring or uh, uh, floaters. It might be all, only a red eye because of the, uh, scler um, the uh, conductible hyperemia. Um, sometimes it is really painful if scleritis is associated. Um, sometimes it's foreign body uh, sensation or greatness. Uh, sometimes it's photophobia or decreased vision because of if the destruction is so severe, uh, astigmatism might uh, happen or even the destructive mechanism can encroach into the central part of the cornea and just uh, decrease the vision. This is um, until we go into uh, the more uh, serious complications. So what do you see? What are the signs? Um, usually it is a crescent-like erosion. Sometimes it's not always straightforward. You might see patches of undermining of the, uh, of the cornea in the periphery that might coalesce as the disease uh, 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 progresses. 
Um, and there's overlying epithelial defect, and this is a very important uh, sign to look for, uh, an under overlying epithelial defect. Uh, there's usually a, a accompanying conjunctival or scleral inflammation with or without vascular inflammation. And this is an important also uh, point in order to differentiate between this and Morin's ulceration. Um, there is thinning, absolutely. Uh, sometimes there might be an infiltrate according to the cause, if it's an infection, if it's a contact lens wear, there might be infiltrate. Um, and the clinical disease severity, we can predict it according to the depth of the ulceration. Yani we can uh, 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 assess if it's progressive and how, how bad it is. We can allocate four stages of the disease. So stage one is if it, if it, stage zero is if there is no thinning at all, just hyperemia at the, uh, at the limbus. Stage one is when it is only one over four from the uh, uh, thickness of the cornea, the ulcer size. Um, stage two is when it is 50%, stage three when it is uh, 75%, and stage four is the melting and the complete destruction of the cornea. And the conjunctival inflammation also is stage uh, from zero to four according to how many quadrants. Now, scleritis is, is a very important uh, uh, differentiating uh, element, and we have to differentiate with scleritis and conjunctival uh, hyperemia, and uh, 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 because scleritis, especially if it's necrotizing, this means it's a very serious disease and this will affect our management plan that I will discuss later on. If it is associated with the uveitic cause, uh, we will see uh, cells in the AC, as I said. And if it's infectious, uh, uh, you might see also hypopian in the AC. Now, we ask... So, uh, Dr. Yeah. Nancy, so... Uh, if there is hypopion, um, definitely it is uh, infectious. We cannot see hypopion in uveitis. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Immune, yes. Now, uh, if it's a ster um, it could be a sterile hypopion, but this is very um, unlikely. Uh, you have to add up to the other. If there's an infiltrate and a hypopion, this is for sure an infectious cause. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, unless it is the herpetic, you see a hypopion, the herpetic keratitis, and the cause is not infectious; it's an inflammation. Uh, uh, but the cause, the cause of the inflammation is, a, is an infective uh, agent. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you see what I mean? Now, hypopion is yeah. an inflammatory response. Uh, uh, sterile hypopion, you can see it in, in cases of uh, uveitic causes, but uveitis per se does not cause PUK. It's what causes mm -hmm. the uveitis. So it's an, an infection is more common to cause PUK. If it's a herpetic infection, this is an inflammatory response, we know, but the, the causative agent is an infection. Okay, clear. Thank you. Now, is it dangerous? Is PUK a dangerous thing? Absolutely, it is. Uh, it's an emergency because it can spread circumferentially and it can cause uh, a contact lens the cornea. As we said, it, it squeezes the cornea so small, uh, encroaching into the center, and uh, uh, this will endanger vision. Also, it might cause perforation. Um, if uh, that, it depends on the cause and the, uh, if there's a, a fulminant uh, inflammation, uh, cataract might uh, uh, also uh, uh, be noticed and glaucoma if there is also a destruction or inflammation in the trabecular meshwork. How we diagnose it? It's very important to know or to remember what Shakespeare said that uh, when sorrows come, they come not in single spies, but in battalions. A PUK usually does not come alone. PUK comes with a lot of uh, superimposing uh, things. So you have to have a high index of suspicion, even if it was a small ulcer in the periphery. And this is why we always say uh, to the junior doctors of the residents, to differentiate between an ulcer that is in the middle of the cornea, which is usually an infectious cause, and an ulcer that is in the periphery of the cornea, which is usually an inflammatory cause, an inflammatory response. And uh, uh, sometimes I say when vessels, uh, when vessels they invade the cornea uh, uh, to, uh, to heal an, an ulcer in the middle, this is a very good sign. Although we don't like to see vessels coming and crossing with the cornea, but in an infection, the vessels coming to the ulcer, this is a very good sign of healing. But in cases of peripheral ulcerative keratitis, if you see an ulcer that is in the periphery, this is a very bad sign. And you, you should not pass it as an infection per se and the patient goes home. So you have to have an index of suspicion and you have to, have, to elicit all the signs or the symptoms uh, uh, through the history. History taking is a very important uh, uh, determinant of uh, the success of your treatment and diagnosis in peripheral ulcerative keratitis because it's usually not a disease only of the cornea, it is a systemic disease manifested in the eye. 
So history of trauma, of any surgery in the eye, especially cryotherapy, if done, any chemical that's been uh, uh, used for uh, in the eye, any contact lens wear. We're now talking about the ocular causes, any uh, infection in the past, any oral tablets that the patient takes for, for hepatic eye disease, for example, any history of Zuster, uh, um, uh, and, uh, any, and then you elicit the system of diseases. You ask about uh, pain in the knees, pain in the uh, knuckles of the fingers, uh, any problems in the back, uh, all the systemic disease that you can elicit. And then uh, after this, you go to the examination. And the examination is very important to look at the patient as a whole, and you ju just not look at the uh, eye as a, uh, as a single organ. So uh, you, you uh, examine the eye properly, uh, trying to elicit any local cause of PUK, and then you go and look at the hands of your patient, ask him to raise a hand, uh, grab, uh, shake hands, Manu Mafi shake hands in Corona time now, just maybe the Corona punch, uh, uh, wave his hand to see his uh, fingers for botany de deformity. And we always see this in the, in the, in the clinic, um, ask about knee problems, deformities, look at the nose if it has an abnormal uh, uh, deformity or configuration because 50% of cases are associated with systemic, systemic disease and mainly rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid can be elicited and almost 50 cases of PUK patients are diagnosed in the cornea clinic. Uh, not to forget Wagner granulomatosis, systo, uh, uh, systemic lupus erythromatosis, relapsing polychondritis. And I know as ophthalmologists, we cannot just memorize all the uh, uh, medical terms and medical uh, diseases that can uh, pour into PUK. And I think this is the main reason we did not go into medicine, but sometimes we have to go back and have a list in our minds. And it's okay to have a list in front of our eyes, actually. So it's very important. This is what I tell my fellows and residents is you see what you look for. If you don't have anything in front of your eyes to look for, even if you cannot grab the information, you can keep this particular slide or this particular uh, 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 table and just put it in front of you on the desk uh, in the clinic. And just if you see a patient with PUK, uh, you can just uh, uh, mix and match and see which one fits into the patient's description. So if a patient has a sudden nose deformity, uh, then think of Wagner glandulitis uh, or relapsing polychondritis. If he has a, a, a pinna, an auricular pinna deformity in his ear, think of uh, 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 relapsing polychondritis. If he has uh, nasal mucosal ulcers, then Wagner is a, a, a most probable diagnosis. Um, uh, systod, uh, uh, systemic lupus SLE erythromatosis, you have to look for the oral, lip, or tongue mucosal ulceration. Also, a butterfly or malar rash, uh, alopecia, uh, hyperpigmentation in the scalp or face. Uh, these are signs that usually direct you into SLE. Um, giant cell arthritis, we all palpate the temple for uh, uh, giant cell arthritis if it is suspected. And if, especially if the patient came back with a high SR or CRP and elderly and just um, there are jaw claudication or temporal uh, paresthesia. Now, rheumatoid arthritis, this is something cannot be missed. The patient with the rheumatoid, and usually it's an advanced disease. You can see the botanier deformity, the swan neck deformity in the fingers. Uh, uh, all these, you can see them and elicit them in the hands. Um, and you can just ask the patient, do you have a rheumatoid or not? And in 80% of cases, the answer would be yes. Uh, uh, there might be subcutaneous nodules in the arms and the legs. And uh, you ask about generally about arthritis. Sometimes you have a patient who is young and presents to your clinic with a, 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 a picture of PUK that comes in, in one eye. Usually patients with systemic disease, they come with bilateral peripheral ulcerative keratitis. One eye might be more prominent than the other. But in, 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 uh, in general, they come with uh, 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 bilaterality, not necessarily symmetri symmetrical involvement. Um, in uh, ocular causes, it is usually, or undiagnosed systemic uh, uh, diseases, um, maybe in the, uh, the beginning of the disease, uh, usually they come younger at age and they come uh, unilateral, be not because they are unilateral, because you might miss the, uh, the eye which has milder symptoms and focus on the eye that has the more prominent symptoms. So it's very important if you see a young patient who has a unilateral PUK, not to uh, eliminate, even with history, uh, the, the systemic cause, because you can discover uh, a systemic cause uh, and uh, save the patient from a long journey of uh, systemic complications. What are the laboratory uh, uh, tests that you should uh, uh, ask for in patients with peripheral ulcerative keratitis? It's a long list. But 
initially you have, um, if you suspect this is a, a, an infection, it's important to swab the eye for infection. Now, most of the, uh, of the infection causes are, as I said, staph, are strep, they are gram positive, so you can cover them with the empirical uh, antibiotics. Um, otherwise, if they're not improving, you can just swab the eye for, the, uh, for a culture. Uh, baseline uh, CBC blood count, because if you needed a systemic immune suppression, you need to have a baseline CBC. Um, ESR is mandatory and CRP. Rheumatoid factor, as I said, it comes 80% positive in patients with rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Um, the uh, ANA, uh, which is uh, anti-nuclear antibody, is for the rheumatoid arthritis specific and the SLE. Um, C and K, and I forgot actually what does that stand for, I, I think anti-cytoplasmic uh, um, nucleoside, something like that, uh, for the uh, Wagner glanomatosis. Uh, ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, is very specific for sarcoid, although it should, it's not mandatory to be uh, a positive. Um, hepatitis C, this is not to be, hepatitis C surface antigen, uh, if uh, you're suspecting uh, uh, or you um, uh, excluded all the uh, mechanical, all the problems or all the patho uh, 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 pathology uh, uh, that might cause the PUK and you wanted to check if there's a hepatitis element, um, chest X-ray and sinus CT is for the Wegener granulomatosis and it's very important to uh, work under teamwork. Now, uh, PUK is not a disease of the cornea only. It is a disease that's covered by a cornea specialist or anterior segment specialist, but it is managed by a lot of specialties. It's managed by the cornea, it's, it's uh, by the general ophthalmologist, and also with the medic, uh, medical immunologist and the, uh, the rheumatologist. It's very important to keep a teamwork uh, managing these patients because these patients are long-term patients. They will come with uh, uh, good days and bad days. They will have a long-term uh, monitoring um, uh, duration for uh, disease management. And uh, you need the rheumatologist and the uh, immunologist and the lab technicians in order to uh, uh, monitor uh, uh, the doses for the uh, systemic immune suppression drugs that you need to give for these patients, if needed. Dr. Nancy, a question, yes. please. Now, uh, if you go back to the list for the laboratory, uh, we may face some patients who cannot afford uh, this list um, expenses, I mean, and they for example, they cannot go to uh, uh, public hospitals for any reason. So mm -hmm. if you want to choose the most important five tests out of this list, what are you going to do to, uh, to order? Okay, this is an excellent question. Thank you. Now, um, the most important test is your, your suspicion. Mm -hmm. So rely on your suspicion. If the patient tells you that he cannot afford this, go back to the list where we set this one of the clinical findings and try to elicit it uh, uh, more meticulously. Um, spend some chair time uh, looking for anything that directs you to which uh, um, disease uh, entity you want to uh, highlight or put your finger on. Now, if you find the patient that has a botanier deformity in his fingers, it's very obvious this is a rheumatoid arthritis patient. So you might skip the list. You just um, uh, uh, ask for a CBC. You don't have to swab. A CBC ESR, rheumatoid will be 80% uh, positive. You don't need this. And um, you can just uh, uh, liaise with the rheumatology and immunology. You can skip the, the other list. Now, the problem is when you have no definitive diagnosis and you want to give a patient a very heavy protocol of immune suppression and you want to justify it. Then you go with um, uh, uh, the ANAs and that CNK and the angiotensin converting enzyme. Although sarcoidosis sometimes can be uh, accompanied with other signs like um, uh, the alopecia, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the ACE inhibitor, and the just, sometimes just CT uh, can elicit this. But um, if, if the, th the most three are the ANA, CNA, and ACE, in addition to the uh, CBC. Fantastic, thank you very much. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, it's very important if you could not put your finger on uh, disease in, uh, integrity um, to start treating right away. It's not important. Now, uh, diagnosing is something you would want to know later, but what you want to, to do is don't send the patient home immediately reassuring him. You have to start treating right away because sometimes the patient might come with a very uh, uh, dormant kind of uh, uh, very smooth uh, uh, disease phase and progression, and you see no change over weeks. 
and suddenly the cornea perforates because sometimes the immune system just plays like a roller coaster and it just spikes uh, and uh, goes into a, a storm of uh, immune response and this uh, degrades the cornea uh, suddenly. So what you need to do, you have an ulcer and the ulcer is due to an inflammatory medi mediators that are eating it away. What you have to do is first you want to lubricate and the reason of lubrication not because you might have a Jogren's or a Jogren's syndrome or a rheumatoid arthritis that because of keratoconjunctivitis seca that might ensue and uh, uh, make the uh, the problem more severe no this is not the reason why we lubricate a patient with peripheral ulcerative keratosis the main issue is that we want to dilute the inflammatory mediators that are swimming in the vicinity of the cornea by putting more water into, into the area. So the more water you put, the more you wash out the effect of the inflammatory mediators and the more you minimize the effect on the cornea. So this is the first thing. The second thing, the, 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 um, the lubrication enhances the healing by uh, making a, a layer over the corneal uh, surface and mediating the stem cells and the uh, epithelial cells to bridge the gap and reach the area of uh, epithelial defect. So this is the main issue with lubrication. Now, if you have an infection, it's very important to kill the bug. And as I said, if you don't... Dr. Nancy, yeah. sorry for interruption. No, 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 please. Uh, now, uh, actually it is an, an amazing point why we use the lubricant here. Uh, yes, not only to uh, enhance re-epithelialization, but for dilution. Yeah, I learned it from you now. Now, do you, do you have any preference of uh, lubricant composition? Uh, or let's say, should we avoid any composition? For example, we know that when there is an inflammatory process, it's better to avoid hyaluronic acid because it is an acidic. And um, maybe we avoid it just uh, until we settle down the, uh, or we calm down the inflammation within a couple of days, then we can move to the hyaluronic acid. Is it the same thing here or uh, is there any preference? Absolutely, this is an amazing question. Now, um, let me put it this way. Avoid ointments, avoid um, viscous gels because you don't want to overweigh the cells that are bridging the gap to reach its site. This is the first thing. Second thing, avoid anything that might add on the inflammatory uh, response. Avoid anything that has preservatives because not, you, you're increasing the problem. So use uh, preservative free drops as much as possible. Avoid, um, use a concentration, a low concentration of hyalur hyaluronic acid if you want to. Um, I would prefer the uh, drops that can be used after a PRK, for example, a surface ablation surgery. Um, drops that might have uh, some uh, vitamin C in it, or uh, ginkgo biloba, or um, any component that will help in healing. But still, the main uh, issue is that it, it is uh, uh, preservative free, and it is not viscous or gel shape. It's very important to be more aqueous. Um, so you you choose the aqueous uh, kind of uh, uh, artificial tears, not the viscous, not the mucin-like, not the ones we, exactly. we use to treat uh, uh, gland dysfunction because of immune mm. deficiency, not the one we use to treat a uh, uh, problem in, uh, in the uh, oily la layer of the cornea. Uh, mm. Treat it as if there is a deficiency in the aqueous layer. We're pouring water. The more water you put, the better effect you get. This is how we look at it. Yeah, very nice. Thank you very much. Amazing uh, lessons today. <laughs> okay, so um, if it is an infection, and the infection usually it, it just you can, you can just spot an infection. If there's an infiltrate, a uh, stromal infiltrate and whitening, plus minus hypopian, uh, localized to one side, uh, history of trauma with, the, with something, um, you need to kill the bug. We said the infection that elicits a PUK usually is a, uh, is a staph or strep. Um, and it is usually, uh, it can be covered with a, a monotherapy, um, Vigamox, uh, uh, Zemaxid, any, um, any of the fluoroquinolones for uh, fourth or fifth generation. Um, usually the infectious PUK, you can see a response very uh, uh, rapid uh, as compared with the inflammatory peripheral assertive keratitis. Now, a very important point to discuss, and we always talk about this. If you suspect PUK in a patient who is already on topical steroid for any reason, for vernal catarrh, for um, uh, dry eye, for anything, um, post-surgery, 
you have to keep the topical steroids at bay um, because they promote progression preparation by inhibiting the collagen formation, خاصة بالvasculitic uh, um, uh, causes such as Wagner, especially in Wagner glandomatosis. There's one or two things that I would uh, uh, use a very mild steroid on the cornea. I'll tell you about it later يعني, as we discuss the treatment. But as a general rule, if the patient uses topical steroids, stop them right away. Um, don't think of it as an inflammation that you need to pour in uh, anti-inflammatory uh, at the same time. It's also important, and this has been going all around, to stop any, and not to think of giving the patient any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops, because you are killing the patient, or killing the, the cornea of the patient, yani, uh, eventually the patient uh, in no time. The patient will have pain-free periods of corneal perforation, and he will come happily perforated. So this is the only thing that you would, cha you would change. So avoid steroids, and I'll tell you the rationale of, of using steroids and avoiding it, and avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops. Nothing anti-inflammatory on the cornea. Use all the anti-inflammatory uh, medication you can systemically, but not on the cornea. So um, as we said, the, F, uh, the, the mild steroid or any steroid you use, it just, just uh, stops the collagen formation and that we need uh, uh, to build up structure. And uh, uh, so uh, it will uh, delay uh, the um, uh, re-epithelialization and strengthening of the corneal tissue and will uh, cause uh, just progression and worsening. Uh, you can give an anti-collagenase, which is a doxycycline or tetracycline. We know tetracycline in, in pregnant women and uh, children under the age of 10 or 11 are uh, not advised. Uh, you can use doxycycline. Actually, I like doxycycline in all, in all patients. Uh, it is a magical uh, component of, uh, it's a magical friend for the cornea. So use doxycycline, 100 milligram uh, for as long, you can use it as long as uh, six weeks, um, and you, you'll be fine and safe, as long as the patient can tolerate it, but tell them to avoid sunlight unless they want to tan, um, to avoid uh, milk and uh, milk derivatives uh, in order to make sure it is uh, it acts uh, properly. Now, doxycycline and vitamin C are very important for the healing of the stroma, for keratocytes. And um, you can see the effect in like 48 hours uh, in front of your eyes. So this is combination of doxycycline and vitamin C is very important for any ulcer and for any stroma necrosis. Uh, and I do, I do tend to, to use this. Um, if there is a systemic association and you can see, see this, like, like if you see the patient having rheumatoid arthritis um, and you start, see that uh, right away, it's very important. If you see uh, the patient is, uh, he has a large uh, peripheral arthritis keratitis to start systemic steroids. Okay, what kind of systemic steroids? Now I come from a school where I use, I believe in the pulsed methylprednisolone because oral therapy needs some time to, uh, to produce any effect. If you go out over 14 days, you need a tapering response and you cannot guarantee that after 14 days, you'll be there in the clinic and you'll just taper it the way it should be. So, and the patient might go into um, a, a long uh, tunnel of uh, complications. So I like it three days, pulse therapy, IV methylprednisolone, um, you can choose between 500 or 1,000 uh, methylprednisolone. You can use it in 200 cc normistaline in uh, half an hour. And um, you can even not see the patient for three days and just come and check him after three days. And this is, in most of the cases, a magical combination. So I vouch for the pulse methyl, except if you have other contraindications, like the patient cannot have uh, uh, cannot be admitted to the hospital or there are no beds or the patient um, um, has, uh, he needs to be on a very low dose of uh, steroids. So we, you'd go with the oral uh, one milligram per kg per day. So you would choose the oral treatment. Otherwise go for the three, three days of pulsing, the methylprednisolone, um, and you can guarantee a satisfaction 80% of cases. Now be aware of the prolonged use. And what I mean prolonged use means um, keeping the patient for four or five weeks on steroids uh, orally without monitoring uh, the response. Sometimes patients, they can come in, uh, um, uh, for example, osteoporosis in, in no time. Uh, they might come with uh, 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 necrosis of the head of femur osteoporosis. Um, uh, sometimes they might come with fracture, comp uh, compression fracture because of the osteoporosis. 
And they come, this comes usually in the young rather than the, than the old, because um, a sudden osteoporotic change in the bone will just cause a, a dramatic uh, response in the body. And this is why if you think that the patient is not uh, improving on the systemic uh, steroid that you're giving, you have to shift straight away to the systemic immune suppression. Before I leave to that, do you need, do you want to ask any question, Dr. Mazen, about the management? Because I want to talk about systemic immunosuppression. Yeah, th thank you very much. Actually, the the uh, the concept of uh, using the steroids is still not clear. Uh, so let let me assume we have a case now, mm -hmm. and uh, the patient came with uh, like uh, peripheral infiltrates, um, no uh, epithelial defect and no thinning. And uh, let's assume that I started steroids uh, with this patient because I assume that it is okay steroid. Now, the patient comes after a couple of days with thinning and epithelial defect. So let's say it is grade two. So uh, we can say that 50% uh, 50 50 of the stroma is thin. Yes. What shall I do? Okay, this is excellent. Stop the steroids? Yes, definitely. Now, uh, what you des described earlier is a marginal cornea. Is that if I saw uh, infiltrates uh, in the margin of the cornea, um, I would think this is a marginal keratitis. I would look at the limb, uh, at the eyelid and see if there's an anterior blepharitis. I would treat as marginal keratitis um, and I would give steroids, which is the hallmark of treatment, the steroids and some antibiotic, mild antibiotic. Now, if I see that the patient comes after two days with a epithelial defect and uh, uh, undermining or ulceration, I know epithelial defect is something and stromal uh, uh, keratolysis and undermining and thinning of the stroma per se is different. So we're talking about, we have to look into the stroma, forget the, the epithelial defect. The epithelial defect comes with so many disease entities. Concentrate and focus on the stroma. So if the stroma is thinning and there's a guttering or an, um, and uh, between the limbus and the, uh, uh, and the stromal guttering, there's a furrow, yani, uh, there's a zay khandaq, Okay, uh, you have to think this is a, a peripheral ulcerative, this is an ulcerative, this is a destructive inflammatory response, and I have to stop the steroids immediately. Now, if I'm in doubt, until I diagnose this properly, I can make the steroid once daily, very uh, weak steroid like fluoromethylone. So fluoromethylone once daily, if you are in doubt and still the picture is not very clear and aggressive to you, but put it in mind that you shifted from a, from a patient that only needs topical treatment to a patient might, who might be a PUK and you're going to work on another uh, mechanism and you start from right away on systemic steroids uh, until you see what's going on and you see him next day if the systemic steroid is doing a good job, you will stop the FML or the fluoromethanone uh, immediately. Okay, fantastic. And what about the Wagner? Now the Wagner gametosis, uh, if you suspect, if you see all the features of Wagner gametosis, or the patient comes to you, maybe undiagnosed with a, a peripheral ulcerative keratitis that's very subtle, not a, let's say plus one only a, a degree of uh, ulceration, it's just a mild guttering that looks like an arc stenulus, and you did not, um, uh, you you could not elicit this as a, a, a complete guttering or a thinning. But the patient comes with a saddle nose and he has uh, this referral with a, a, a long uh, list of uh, uh, tests that he has. And he has a positive uh, test for Wagner gametosis or a CT or chest x ray. Then, um, uh, then what you do is you stop any steroids, no matter what the case on the cornea is happening immediately, because in no time he will perforate. This patient will perforate in no time. And you must be aware of this. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I think some people are. Um, yeah, there is a question. question. Yeah, there is a question. If you allow me to uh, to say uh, some minor points. Uh, PUK in elderly patients, especially rheumatoid arthritis related, admission is necessary due to the fact that the patient often have difficulty installing the drops. So this leads us to the question: When do you admit the patient of PUK? I always admit any patient that I need to give IV methylprednisolone, whether it is elderly or is it is a young. Any patient for pulse therapy, I admit him or her. Uh, if they cannot uh, be admitted, then they come on a, a daily basis to take the uh, a pulse methyl 
and uh, at least stay in the hospital for four hours to monitor them. They can go, uh, go back and um, come back again uh, next day for the second dose. So um, I prefer systemic admission to any patient who would take a, a pulsed treatment, especially the elderly. Yeah, so only for pulse, but um, apart from no. that? No. Okay. Um, also, uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, says, uh, also consider eye protection, like eye shields. Oh, yes. These are the things that you need to tell the patient for that the cornea is very thin and fragile. Don't rub your eye. Some people or some practice, they, they place a contact lens on the cornea. I do not prefer this because a contact lens um, might, the edge of it, uh, as it moves, it might just endanger the, uh, the thin area and cause more damage. So I prefer not to use a contact lens. Unless the cornea is very, very thin and you want to bath the eye with, uh, uh, with lubrication, uh, then you can just uh, use a lens. We, and I prefer it to be a, a large diameter lens in order to cover uh, the whole area of cornea and sclera. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, before I read the question of Dr. Mohammed, now, uh, do you lower the IOP? Uh, just to avoid perforation in uh, high risk cases, for example, giving some drops or maybe uh, acetazolamide orally? Hmm. Fascinating question. Now, I don't lower the IOP anticipating a perforation, but I do lower the IOP if it is just impending. Like if I have patients with uh, an, a, per a real perforation that's plugged by an iris, let's say, or a decimatoseal that's a very thin, I do use, uh, if the, even if the, IO, uh, if the intraocular pressure is low, I use uh, timidol drops, uh, which is very inflammation friendly. Avoid uh, uh, anything that's prostaglandin analog, avoid acetazolamide drops because they are, um, uh, they do provoke uh, inflammation more. So avoid these, uh, abstain from these drops. Uh, the most friendly uh, IOP lowering agent is the timidol or the uh, beta blocker. So I do use it uh, if I feel the, that the eye is uh, uh, on the verge of perforating or if it is already perforated and we're uh, waiting for it to, uh, to re-epithelize or do any kind of surgery. Um, I want to say something. Uh, usually the perforation is not that common in peripheral ulcerative keratitis compared to perforation with infective keratitis. You see infective keratitis uh, perforation uh, associated especially with herpetic keratitis more often than you see with PUK um, for many reasons. First, uh, PUK is usually a stromal keratolysis. You need, and you're talking about the periphery, it's a 0.7 millimeter of, uh, uh, of thickness. So in order to eat off all this, uh, you need a very aggressive uh, inflammatory response. Um, what accelerates this is the steroid drops or non the anti-inflammatory drops that you might use, especially if the patient has a wagner ganglion process. Otherwise, um, even if you reach like uh, plus uh, three uh, guttering, uh, it's not that, uh, uh, you will not see that perforation unless the patient has an infection like a herp herpes, or if it's a micro trauma with a rubbing the eye or uh, sleeping, um, uh, that's why I, I prefer sleeping with an eye shield, uh, like a cartella or something, when they go to bed, uh, so as to uh, avoid micro trauma to the eye. Yeah, perfect. Um, of course, uh, uh, to take care about what, when we prescribe the beta blockers uh, to avoid uh, when the yeah. patient has asthma or uh, any heart. Uh, yes, asthma, yes. Yeah. Now, do you consider punctal plugs? Actually, this is one of the main. Uh, on behalf of you, I'm going to, to answer. <laughs> yes. This is one of the main malpractice, actually, yes, because yes, we yes, are yes. pulling the the toxins over the yes. ocular surface. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is a big no-no. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I always say, uh, uh, if if, yeah. if 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 the if the bathing solution is 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 sick, please don't keep it around. Just خلي it صرف يعني. So, yeah. Um, do you use the cyclosporine? Yes, of course, definitely. Um, shall I talk about it when I just discuss the management? This is just. Uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, um, cycloplegic, cyclo, I, I read it mistakenly, cyclosporine. No, it is. Uh, do you prescribe cycloplegic 
agents to uh, relax the muscle to not for train for something? Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there's a very big difference between the pain that comes from a vitreal defect and causes the uh, muscle spasm and that we use cycloplegic agents to relax the patient and the pain that comes from the ulcerative keratitis because of the keratolysis. And if you, if you ask the same patient in two different eyes, one eye has an epithelial defect due to, let's say, herpes or an epithelial defect due to uh, PRK, and the other eye has a PUK, which eye hurts you more? He will definitely, he will definitely point to the eye that has an epithelial defect that's uh, 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 scratched away the epithelium. So this is the, the, the time that I use a sacrophagic agent. Now, usually in patients with um, uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis, I try to be as minimum as possible with using topical agents, because uh, the more modest you are in using topical uh, treatment on the eye, the more uh, you give it a chance to just uh, uh, to heal. Uh, so um, they're usually not screaming from pain unless the, the cause is a amoeba or the cause is an infection like a staphylococcus, uh, staphylococcal infection, keratitis. That's the time when I give them cycloplegic agents. And usually when you start lubricating the patient and you give a pulse uh, a methylprednisolone, um, the pain just is uh, tolerable right away. It will go down to uh, one or two out of 10 and uh, uh, the patient will be um, happy. Uh, you don't see a patient with PUK screaming unless the underlying cause is really painful. Okay, great. So go on, Dr. Nancy, thank you. Okay. Um, we were talking when to immunosuppress. So uh, we said that topical treatment uh, should be kept as minimum as possible. Uh, lubrication is a, is a hallmark of the topical treatment. Uh, uh, we do use uh, uh, topical steroids just in very uh, one or two situations, and, and I'll talk about this uh, shortly. Um, and uh, sometimes topically is, uh, includes the cyclosporin, uh, which is the restasis, also in, in, uh, in one or two uh, situations uh, that I will just discuss. Now, uh, the mainstay of treatment is the steroids, but sometimes we have to skip the steroids and to go for the systemic, uh, for the systemic immune suppression. And this is in few uh, uh, situations. It, first, if you see that the steroids has caused a side effect and uh, uh, the patient is uh, uh, having a major side effect of steroid, like, let's say the diabetes is shooting very high and not controlled. And if the patient is not responsive on three days of immunosuppression, of steroid suppression, then you have to go uh, uh, straight away to immune suppression. Um, if the patient has wedding granulomatosis or a, a severe case of polyarthritis nodosa, a severe case of rheumatoid or drug rins, the inflammatory markers in the CRP is sky high. The patient is a plus four impending perforation and you start systemic steroids as well as uh, immune, systemic immune suppression. So you give like IV methylprednisolone and you liaise with the rheumatology and, and immunology to start on a cyclophosphamide. This, these go arm in arm together, okay? Now, uh, in cases of a progressive Morin's ulcer, and I'll be discussing Morin's ulcer uh, 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 on its own, uh, because a Morin's ulcer, uh, there are two types. Uh, either a Morin's ulcer that's indolent and very benign, and this comes in the, in the elderly people, or a very aggressive one unilateral in, 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 uh, in the young. And if you see a Morin's ulcer that's aggressive, not responsive in a young patient, then you have to go into systemic immune suppression with, with steroids uh, right away. Uh, because otherwise they will uh, go into perforation as, uh, uh, as fast as possible. Now, uh, also, if you see signs of uh, necrotizing sclerosis associated with the, uh, uh, with the systemic uh, disease or all the signs that you see in the eye, if they see that the sclera is necrotizing and there is a, 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 a severe or a form of this, you go straight away into immune suppression. So immune suppression straight away if there's an aggressive Morin's ulcer, if you have uh, um, an ecrotizing scleritis, these are the signs that you look for, or in a case of a very active systemic disease, like uh, referred from medicine or from sometimes from dermatology, that this patient has a severe form of disease, he's admitted, and his eye is, looks like this. You see him in clinic, you don't wait for IV methyl to, 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 to work. You just uh, put him on a systemic immune suppression with cyclophosphamide or methotrexate. 
And the last thing, which is the more relaxed uh, uh, protocol, is that you start the time on uh, uh, intravenous methylprednisolone, and you did not see any response after two or three days, then you would consider uh, uh, the uh, uh, systemic immune suppression. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, what are the uh, uh, the garments that we use? What are the immune suppressive agents that we use? There are a lot. Um, I will not be covering all of them because I'm, I'm just covering the things that I use in my practice. The most common, sometimes if it's, this is more complicated, I do liaise with the Medicare retina people and the, the immunology, rheumatology uh, for a protocol that we share. Uh, usually what I use for my patients, as I said, it's IV methylprednisolone. If they're not responsive or they're very severe, especially in the young, by the way, the young, they present with a severe uh, form of PUK rather than the old. Let's say because the, the immune machinery is still working, it's just exactly like the COVID. If the immune response in the young is much more uh, uh, profound than the, uh, the, the than the elderly, and that's why you see a more paramount uh, uh, response. So what I do, I put them on cyclophosphamide, um, especially if, the, if it's a, an ocular immune uh, response. Um, uh, and I do cycles of cyclophosphamide. Uh, I repeat it every two weeks. Usually I have to obtain a baseline uh, CBC of, the patient has to have a baseline CBC or white blood cell count of 4,000 in order to give cyclophosphamide uh, safely. And you give it um, like over uh, half an hour, a 500 milligram, and you repeat it every two weeks for a cycle of six weeks. And uh, this is the first line in uh, systemic diseases such as uh, uh, systemic lupus or Wagner glomerulosis. And uh, now the rheumatoid, I'll go to the methotrexate usually. Uh, but the cyclophosphamide works better with uh, most of my patients. Um, and that's why uh, sometimes I do keep them. If I already started them on IV methyl for three days and then I shifted them uh, to cyclophosphamide, it's okay to, uh, 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 to abstain from giving uh, oral uh, treatment and you just rely on the cyclophosphamide uh, to evaluate uh, the problem after two weeks. Um, now, these uh, agents, what they do, you, you cannot... Uh, expect that uh, the ulcer will um, will heal and 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 uh, that quickly, especially if there is a systemic uh, manifestation. Uh, what you look for is that halting of the disease uh, uh, progression. So if the patient has Wagner, you just look for that no progression. No progression is a good is a good sign. In rheumatoid arthritis, on the contrary, as long as you give a high dose of methylprednisolone. Um, along with the vitamin C and doxycycline, you will see a, a very quick response and the epithelialization and uh, uh, building of uh, stroma will be very quick. Now, the other uh, garments that we use is methotrexate, as I said, and a protocol that's very similar to cyclophosphamide. As a, the azathioprim, uh, uh, which is the neural, the generic name, um, and I usually use it uh, um, uh, also for patients with uh, uh, um, and I meant the neural, I meant the cyclosporin, I meant uh, for patients with rejection, but it is a very mild uh, uh, effect. So if the patient is going into a, a remission and you, you don't want any uh, of the complication from these agents, you can shift to the cyclosporin orally and you can also use uh, the cyclosporin topically if you think that you are curbing the inflammation. And especially if it's a modern ulcer, you started him like on two, two weeks uh, uh, protocol of treatment and the patient is going into a quiet phase of uh, quietening and the inflammation is subsiding and the cornea is building up some tissue, you can switch uh, into a topical cyclosporin or an oral cyclosporin, uh, which is more uh, uh, tolerated by the patients. Now, if the patient comes with a very severe form that he's not or she's not um, responsive to uh, any of the immune suppressive drugs, not the cyclophosphamide, not the methotrexate or the azathioprine, and you can see that it's ensuing and impending, um, going into a very uh, fulminant uh, case of uh, corneal uh, uh, keratolysis, you can go into the biological agents. Now, although the biological agents are the third line of treatment, they are not um, approved to be uh, 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 curative, let's say. So it does not mean because they're the third line that, that they're the best, no. And uh, between brackets, they are the most expensive, by the way. They're very expensive. And we go to them because we have depleted all the resources. But sometimes kicking in anti-tumor cross factor, which is infleximab, such a, which can curb the systemic disease, 
Adalimumab, uh, that I've never seen uh, in my practice. I've seen the infliximab, I've treated, uh, dealt with infliximab and rituximab in non-responsive cases. Just kicking in this biological agent can also uh, curb the inflammation in unresponsive cases. This does not mean that it is superior uh, option, but sometimes this addition of a biological agent works better on some patients and not on others. So this is just uh, to know. Now, it's very important to remember that if the cornea heals, this does not mean the end of the treatment session. These patients are chronic patients. They are um, frequent visitors for the clinic. Um, they will come visit you every month just to make sure everything is fine. And you have to tell them there are good days and bad days. It depends on the immune response. Very important to boost the immune system by multivitamins and um, changing the diet, the, uh, the, uh, the lifestyle of these patients in order to curb any flare up of the disease and any effect on the cornea in the future. And uh, sometimes you have to go with therapy as long as six months if the disease is systemic. About, uh, when we talk about uh, corneal problems, uh, we're just talking about uh, the, the time you need just to heal the cornea and to take uh, off the offending agent. That's it. Yeah, perfect. Uh, any further protocol? Ah, surgical role. Now, ah. before that, before, before that, that, doctor. Uh, now, let's assume that I am a general ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, maybe I, I don't have an access to such protocols. I cannot apply them. I have no experience with them. I don't know how to monitor the patient um, systematically or systemically. So what I'm going to do, I will share the, for example, the rheumatologist or the specialist in um, immune diseases, mm -hmm. and he will put the protocols and I will monitor the eye, Absolutely. right? So yes. uh, when I want to refer the patient to the, uh, that specialist, uh, what I understood now that there are two factors to determine which protocol, the, uh, how, how, uh, intensive uh, the therapy will be, which are the age of the patient and how severe is the uh, PUK, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, when I want to refer, what I am going to write in a letter to mm -hmm. that specialist, which will guide that specialist to the best protocol to the patient. As a general ophthalmologist, I'm talking about general ophthalmologist. Yes, that's very important, actually, because this is what's, what's been going on. Uh, this is how we practice most of the time. Um, your input should be uh, your examination. You should examine the patient very thoroughly um, and put your input about what you think this is. Now, the moment you decide to refer this to an immunologist or, a, or a, a general medicine, let's say, this means that you have excluded the local ocular causes. This is very important because you have to, yeah, it's not justified at all to put the patient through a dilemma of uh, immune suppression for a local cause. So your role as, a, as, a, as an ophthalmologist is to, uh, uh, to exclude any local ocular cause of the disease. This is first. The second thing, if you need assistance with the, uh, what kind of tests, because I'm sure nobody of us can memorize all the tests, the, the immunological tests that we need, and which test for which disease, then uh, uh, you can just uh, ring a, a doctor or a consultant about, um, I'm suspecting PUK and I need to run general tests. He can advise you about this. Let's say this before sending the patient over for any treatment. Now, the tests came back and there are some positives and negatives and uh, you suspect this is going into, let, let's say rheumatoid arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis. No two doctors can uh, argue about that. Um, now, the more difficult is, you know, SLE sometimes can be elicited easily. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, uh, the more difficult uh, polyarthritis nodosa or these vasculitis. Now, it's very important to differentiate between an autoimmune disease that's like ocular psychiatric pemphigoid that is indolent an aggressive vasculitic disease like Wegener granulomatosis. Why? Because one is very aggressive and might ensure into uh, severe complications and the other is just indolent. And so if you uh, were a little bit uh, lazy or uh, you delayed the, the management, it's fine, it's, it's okay until you make up your mind or the patient makes up his mind. Now, you send the patient or you consult the, 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 the inter internist or rheumatologist or immunologist if you have a high index of suspicion for a vasculitic disease, or the patient is in a very aggressive form of peripheral ulcerative keratitis, 
And usually you see the very aggressive form in the uh, uh, young, not the elderly. And, uh, uh, and the patient is not responding you to your uh, uh, pulse steroid. These are um, brainstorming for you that this patient is going in down a slope and uh, you have to save the, the body or save the eye. And usually um, when the patient comes with a severe form of peripheral assertive keratitis, it is because the disease entity, the, the systemic disease entity is already attacking his body in an aggressive way and he needs uh, intervention. So you write this to the, to the physician. Um, this is a patient with a peripheral assertive keratitis. I've excluded any ocular cause. I think the input of I think will lead him into which protocol to go. I think this patient might have uh, an element of systemic vasculitis, and I leave it to you to, to decide for your own uh, immune suppression protocol. That's it. He might send him back to you for a checkup after a week or two weeks or so. Now, sometimes you do have um, a conflict between us and the rheumatologist. Um, if you, if sometimes I might think this is a patient, if the patient is referred to me from an, uh, uh, an outside clinic, and he's already diagnosed, like, like for example, this is a patient of ocular psychiatric pemphigoid, and he's already on methotrexate, and they think that the patient is not um, improving, and they want me to uh, um, to check him. And when I see the patient, I think that this is, um, uh, I don't think that methotrexate is the uh, treatment of choice. I think cyclophosphamide works better on the eye, maybe not on the body, but it works better on the eye, from my experience. Um, sometimes we go into arguments, and at the end we say, "Okay, let me just let me just try the cyclophosphamide. If the patient improves, then you'll go my way. If the patient does not improve, you will go your way, and we'll add a, a biological agent. And this is sometimes how we do, because re remember, taking a biopsy is not always favorable in a patient which is inflamed. Taking a biopsy is not favorable in sclerosis. Taking a biopsy is not favorable in patients with uh, uh, um, uh, uh, ocular psychiatric pemphigoid. Uh, a patient with vasculitis that can ensure a, a, a fulminant vasculitic uh, event in the, uh, in the sclera is also not something you want to do. So leave the biopsy aside unless you want to take it from somewhere else to prove your diagnosis. So this is not a disease entity. We all have a clear cut mind about it. It's okay to have um, a decision and then change it according to the circumstances. So don't panic. The most important thing, stop the steroids if you're already started. Don't reach with your patient to a, to a level of perforation while he is in inflammation. Let, don't let him perforate while the eye is inflamed because otherwise you cannot, you cannot do anything at that, at that time. Um, at least keep him plateauing until you decide which way to go. So this is maybe my message to most of the, uh, the eye doctors. Perfect. Thank you very much. When? OK. OK, I'm just trying to. It's not uh, moving. OK. Um, the important question is there, is there a surgical role for a disease that is inflammatory in its all hallmark? The question is yes. And if we understand why this happens, we know how we can uh, uh, at least stop it, halt it, or uh, decrease the effect, put it in a plateau, let's say, or treat it. We all know that the problem is not in the cornea. The problem is in the whatever is around the cornea. It's in the sclera, in the conductiva, in the vessels, in the lymphatics, in the immune mediators that's pouring in the cornea. So as long as we cannot stop it with drugs, we can stop it with knives. We can just cut away the, that segment of the cornea, uh, of the conjunctiva or partial sclera that is adjacent to the area of uh, undermining or guttering until we reach a stage that we curb the inflammation and the guttering and the, uh, and the thinning. This is an option that you, you, we usually do, especially in Warren's uh, uh, ulceration, that is very aggressive. So we, resection, a local resection for a local inflammatory response. Now, if the patient is going into severe thinning, you are already uh, controlling the inflammation. The, now the conjunctiva is, um, the scleritis is uh, uh, settling, the conjunctiva looks quiet, the eye looks less uh, uh, aggressive, but still the cornea is um, plus three and it's uh, on the verge of perforating. Then can it do something? Yes, we can. We can go in and patch it. Yani patch it uh, means uh, augmenting the tissue. 
adding some more tissue in order to make it um, more uh, or less fragile or less uh, weak. We can put it, uh, put a corneal graft, a uh, patch graft. You can put an amniotic membrane graft. Now, the good thing about amniotic membrane is that not only it, uh, um, it gives us uh, uh, growth factors uh, and uh, the, like the insulin-like growth factor and uh, uh, nutrition and uh, a matrix, a cellular matrix for uh, the uh, keratocytes to grow into. It also, it is anti-scar uh, uh, formation uh, uh, and it helps in the healing mechanism. So this is very important. Now, if, if the eye is inflamed, the amniotic membrane will dissolve in one week. If the eye is quiet, it will stick there for two, three weeks until the eye recovers its uh, potential to, to heal. You can put a conjunctival graft. I don't like this option, but I have to, to mention it because the conjunctival graft means that you have invited the vessels into the cornea forever. And you're just putting this as a last way resort and nothing else. You're, you have a a poor prognosis about this eye, and you're putting a, a conjunctival graft, um, it's like a last man standing uh, option. Uh, so I don't like it. Um, if you have a minute, minor perforation, that's like one millimeter, two millimeter in size, and it is discrete, you know where it is, you can just glue it. And I've already, in one of the suturing uh, uh, series, I've uh, already mentioned how we do the gluing technique. And this is exactly the same. Uh, uh, you have to make sure that the eye is not very inflamed to glue. Um, we went to the lamella graft, which is uh, uh, a part of the sclera. Uh, uh, it's a, a part of the cornea that we take in order to cover the defect and uh, uh, enforce uh, the uh, stroma. And last but not least, if there's a big perforation melting, uh, then uh, uh, or the keratocytic effect is, is very large and you cannot control it, then uh, 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 the solution is to do a penetrating keratoplasty that is full thickness. And it's very important. If you want to perform a penetrating keratoplasty on a patient who has a peripheral ulcerative keratitis, it's very important to do a 360 degrees periotomy to remove the conjunctiva away from the new cornea and to make your new cornea as large as possible because you want to replace the one already invaded by inflammatory mediators and to replace it with one that's new and fresh and to move away the conjunctiva, the hostile conjunctiva that is attacking uh, your tissue. I think there are 10 comments um, just beeping in the... Let me check this before... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm following, I'm following them. Yeah, yeah. So no worries. You can All go right. on whenever uh, I find it yeah. uh, suitable. Yeah, because, um, okay. um, yeah, this is for the surgical room. I'm not sure what it is. Oh, yeah, there's something else we need to talk about now. Warren's um, ulcer. I know for sure that a lot of people or a lot of ophthalmologists um, have a problem with Warren's ulcer because it they cannot just diagnose it. And there's always a problem during examination to differentiate between turn marginal degeneration and Morin's ulceration, as if it makes a difference. And I'm just telling you, uh, it's not important to know this is a Morin's ulcer or not, as long as you know this is a peripheral keratitis that you need to treat in the way uh, properly. Now, if you reach diagnosis of Morin's ulcer, and this is to salute Dr. Morin, who discovered this in 1854. Actually, it's Dr. Bowman. Who, the, who appointed uh, um, uh, this entity in 90, it, it was 1849, and then uh, who published a lot of cases about it was Dr. Morin, and that's why it's called Morin's ulcer. So to salute him and not to neglect this diagnosis, um, it's okay to uh, dig deep and uh, reach this diagnosis, but it's not mandatory. Don't waste your time digging what kind of ulceration is this, and start treating the patient right away. Now, let me tell you some um, differentiating factors between a modern ulceration and um, a peripheral ulcerative keratitis due to uh, a systemic uh, vascularitis. Um, first, it's a separate entity. Um, unlike the other vasculitic causes uh, that are associated uh, with uh, um, uh, an epithelial defect, this has an intact epithelium, which means it targets the stroma. It uh, causes keratolysis and, and uh, um, undermining and gathering of the stroma, leaving a ridge, um, a ridge of or a flag, uh, a white flag uh, uh, overlooking it. Uh, and this, uh, this is what's uh, characteristic of uh, Morris ulceration. And the other thing, it does not have a severe inflammation of the conjunctiva as clear around it. There might be mild hyperema, but 
Compared to the uh, scleritis or PUK associated with uh, uh, systemic diseases, uh, it cannot be compared. It's very minimal. So these are the, uh, the factors that are in, in, in favor of the Morris. Now, Morris can come in so many um, uh, shapes. It can come in young age, and it can come in the old age. Now, in the old age, usually it is unila, it is bilateral, and it is um, uh, it's very uh, indolent and uh, mild. In the young, it, and this is why I call it benign. In the young, it's malignant, and it cuts through the, the stroma so so quickly, uh, and it's progressive from the beginning. And and it's the only time I prefer you use topical steroids is with the modern ulceration. So if I said to abstain from any topical steroids in, in your practice with the PUK, it's all but the modern ulceration. But you have to make sure this is a modern before you go for the topical steroids, which is the fluoromethylone. Mild topical steroid twice daily until you make sure or make up your mind that this is modern ulceration because it curves the inflammatory response so quick. Topical cyclosporin is also a very added value in this kind of infl inflammation because it is a topical inflammation. It's a local inflammation compared to the systemic uh, vasculitis inflammation. So this is a case where you need uh, 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 local uh, uh, immune mediate, uh, immune markers or immune uh, 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 treatment in order to uh, modify uh, the eye's response. So uh, fluoromethanone twice daily, lubrication is a must, and uh, uh, topical cyclosporin are game changers in modern ulceration per se. Um, where do you see the modern ulcer? Usually it is interpalpebral. Uh, it starts on the uh, three and nine o'clock position and circumferential spread is very quick. Um, the second most common is you see it inferiorly and then it, it moves uh, uh, nasally. So these are the, more, uh, the three most common. Although this picture, it says about superior modern, but this is not the most common. No, this is what I found actually. Um, now the hallmark of the disease, as we said, is the undermining of the irregularly scalloped central edge. And this is how it is uh, 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 described. It's an overhanging central edge or ridge that you see, it's, you see it like a flag uh, and uh, it gives you a shelf uh, effect. And sometimes you think this is less severe than the PUK that you see with the rheumatoid arthritis. On the contrary, this is more severe. Um, perforation sometimes ensues so rapidly, especially if you have a young patient don't wait for the topical agents only to, to, to start working and start with the uh, immune suppression uh, if you have a young patient with unilateral uh, modern immediately. Now, sometimes there are some things you have to elicit in the history of modern disease that will guide you into uh, the diagnosis. They are provocative. So these are what I call provocatives for modern ulceration. Modern is a very is a rare entity, but it's important to elicit um, because the, 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 the topical treatment is a little bit uh, different than the usual one. Um, usually, uh, the patient has a, a history of herpes, uh, eye disease, and if the patient is young, um, eliminate uh, or exclude herpetic eye disease. If he's old, zoster. Um, sometimes the patient would have been hit by a parasitic infection. We had a patient who was um, a young uh, lady who was pregnant and uh, she had a parasitic infection like three months before uh, modern ulceration started. And we thought this is a PUK and we uh, treated her as a PUK. She was um, pregnant. We could not add any systemic steroids. We tried the local to mix and match local uh, uh, treatment. And then until we made sure this is a modern ulceration and we did a surgical resection of the conjunctiva in order to, uh, uh, and we advised early uh, um, uh, cesarean section because the cornea was very thin. She cannot go into uh, delivery, um, normal uh, delivery because that would compromise the, the cornea. And uh, yeah, we, we, we guided her through months of treatment until she had uh, her baby um, in a good shape. Uh, you have uh, sometimes trauma or surgery, especially if you do cryotherapy, it might provoke modern aceration. As we said, treatment is to curb the inflammation with drops. You use mild steroids and cyclosporin has a very important factor uh, in, in uh, topical cyclosporin. Um, it's important to remove the hostile tissue. And what, what I mean is uh, resect the conjunctiva or the inflammatory to decrease the uh, load of the inflammatory mediators that are swimming around the cornea. And we don't forget the systemic treatment. Uh, systemic pulse steroid is very important unless the patient cannot tolerate this. And of course, never forget with the systemic pulse steroid to add anything that protects the cornea, the, the, the stomach, like proton pump inhibitors, because the patient will come with a stress ulceration afterwards and he can sue you. And um, last but not least is the biological agent, not because they're 
uh, uh, more potent, but just because they add uh, to the effect of the treatment you have already started. And I think this is all. Um, I believe also always that um, know thyself, know thy enemy. A thousand battle and a thousand victory. So I, I hope this is uh, beneficial to a lot of uh, who are watching. Yeah, thank you very much for the amazing lecture as usual, Dr. Nancy. No, now, is you. there any role to the cross-linking for uh, in, the, in the PUK? Uh, this is an important question. Um, I've seen few papers talking about cross-linking in uh, peripheral associative keratosis, and I do not advise that because the cornea is already in um, uh, geared up inflammatory state. We are adding a riboflavin uh, uh, to go into the corneal uh, stroma. Um, and sometimes we have patients who receive a riboflavin, they, have, they go into a toxic keratopathy, which is an inflammatory response to riboflavin with UV lights. So would I just jeopardize the cornea by trying cross-linking? Actually, I wouldn't, unless, unless in one condition, the, the, the provoking factor for PUK is infective. If I have like a fungal infection that's causing the cornea to melt and there's a peripheral sensitive keratitis and I am losing control, then I would go on crossing because what I do, I'm just uh, halting and uh, decreasing the load of the, uh, the, the infective uh, 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 microorganism that's hitting the cornea. So by that time, I can just uh, uh, re- uh, um, reassemble myself, uh, try to uh, think, uh, stop and think and to see where I'm standing, it gives me a very large window of opportunity. So if I'm losing control because of an infection, then uh, I would go for a cross thinking. Otherwise, I would wait a little bit until studies um, would prove the efficacy of cross thinking for PUK. And very, not, to forget, good. Yeah. Not, to forget, not to forget something very important. PUK is a, is a peripheral margin, a peripheral degeneration. And cross-linking works in the central cornea. We avoid uh, uh, going into the limbus. If we go to the limbus and hit it with riboflavin and UV light, we're just killing the stem cells. So we add another problem. So we don't cross-link unless maybe we take a two, three clock hours of, of tissue. And um, if we lose two, three clock hours of stem cells, it's fine, as long as it can be um, substituted. So this is my rationale actually for it. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Aqaba. Uh, he is cornea spe specialist and working in the UK. Uh, and um, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Nancy, um, yeah, uh, we can hear him and we can uh, see if he has uh, some highlights. So, welcome, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and I always enjoy these sort of series of lectures and uh, enjoy listening to your talks and uh, uh, Dr. Nancy talks. To be honest, I don't have that much to add on. I mean, it's, uh, uh, she mentioned almost um, everything related to the UK, uh, sort of the common practice. And uh, I just want to highlight this is an excellent point, the, the sort of conflict always we get between us and the rheumatologist, especially in the diagnosed cases. Um, I've had so many cases with the rheumatoid arthritis patients. Mm -hmm. From the rheumatology point of view, they are stable, but they present to us with sort of aggressive PUK. And obviously we admit them, we start them on oral steroid or methylpred, um, the, the issue sometimes when we do the referral letter um, to, to, to the rheumatologist to ask them that this patient has got a PUK, it's a manifestation of systemic flare-up. They don't, most of the time, they don't grasp this thing. They don't, uh, they don't think this, the eye manifestation is a sign of systemic flare-up and they need to modify the systemic mm -hmm. immune therapy. And we get the patients back and forth uh, with the, all the referrals and, and saying back, you know, this patient has been always his joint problem stable, his inflammatory markers in the blood are stable. So we don't think this is some, something related to rheumatoid arthritis. And especially uh, when we have a new consultant coming in rheumatology department. So what happened is we have a, a pack of all evidence in form of papers. We email it to the new consultant or to the new colleague to, to let them know, um, to read it through the, the papers and to, to grasp more about this complex eye problem. Um, most of the time we succeed, the other times we have to refer the patient to another colleague. Um, one way I've seen it in other trusts, they do 
what we call a multidisciplinary, uh, a joint clinic. Uh, they don't do it that often, uh, maybe once a month, uh, all these cases like acute cases that have been seen quite frequently, we do see them together and then um, it, it will be a really great sort of experience because you know what they sort of questions they ask, uh, what sort of the protocols they have. And at the same time, we show, show them our findings and what it meant by the, by the uh, disease activity. Mm -hmm. so this is really, really an excellent clinical um, sort of practical point. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, thank you for raising this point uh, up, actually. Yes, because this is what I meant. It has to be a joint uh, uh, kind of cross-reference, even if it's once a month. I know that in UK, we've used to see the inflammatory uh, uh, diseases on the inflammatory manifestation of, um, of uh, uh, systemic diseases much more pronounced than in our part of the area. In our part, it's more of infectious uh, uh, keratitis uh, causing these uh, pictures. But, uh, at the end, it's all about um, what's in the benefit of the patient. Um, um, moving on to uh, proving your point of view, they have, sometimes I say, they have to see what we see in order to know what we're talking about. Um, the patient is not a list of laboratory uh, results. Um, not, does not mean that if the, uh, uh, the RF factor just uh, dipped down while the eye is still angry that I'm happy about, whatever protocol he's going into. Uh, Sometimes I switch it just based on the clinical picture of the patient. If he's going okay and um, uh, improving, um, regardless what the rheumatologist would say, I would just go with my own opinion because at the end, he's an eye, eye patient. And I think in my opinion, uh, the eye is a reflection of a mirror of the, uh, of the body. So as long as he's just going into a quiet phase, then I know that I'm, uh, I'm putting him in the right direction. And uh, sometimes uh, a few conflict with our uh, uh, colleague physicians is something okay. Salt and pepper. Excellent. And the other point is uh, actually the, you know, like here, as you said, uh, we see uh, the PUK actually more common than in mm -hmm. Middle East. Yes. And, uh, due to this cultural thing, you know, uh, most of the elderly people, they live on their own. Okay. It's actually in our countries, it's a blessing because most of our, uh, you know, um, uh, granddad or grandpa, they live with their uh, families, big families. So they always, there is somebody to put the drops in for them. And these rheumatoid arthritis patients, they have joint deformities. So if you ask them to put lubricating drops every hour, in addition to maybe some antibiotic preservative free, um, they won't be able to manage it. They will have difficulty. And the first few maybe weeks are crucial. So um, we get them admitted here in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we we have nurses, you know, they put the drops every hour for them. So that would make a huge difference uh, for them. Maybe yeah, this is not really, really, uh, you know, applied to the um, to the patients in, in our countries. Yeah. I know, before I knew, this is your, you who, who mentioned the, uh, the admission thing. I thought this is a practice that's done outside uh, our area. Because yes, uh, sometimes um, living in a, maybe sometimes in a, uh, elderly and, uh, and uh, just isolated without anybody to help. Um, yeah, uh, it was a protocol to admit these patients only for installation of drops. I do remember that when I used to be a fellow, so it's just for drop installation. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where do you practice, Dr. Muhammad? Uh, well, I do practice in uh, South Yorkshire at the moment. Um, oh. I practice a lot in Nottingham with the Professor Dewa. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Lucky. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. I am the lucky one because I'm learning from both of you. <laughs> We're lucky to be on this platform. Oh, Thank you very much. Well, we'll be quite honored actually to have you around, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. Now, there is a question. Uh, which concentration of the cyclosporine do you use um, as topical drops? Is oh, it yes. a 0 0.1, 0 0.05? 0 0.05, 0 mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yeah. Twice, um, sometimes I go up to four times daily, as long as it's in the mm -hmm. I do cycles of topical cyclosporine, by the way. It's very important to know that if you know, use immune suppression uh, drops or drugs, it's very important to go into cycles and not to maintain it um, monotonous all the time because you will lose the value of uh, immune modulation. So don't keep a patient on cyclosporine for long. I just do like four weeks and then I stop it and reinstall it for another four weeks or so. It's just cycles. 
boosting, uh, making the immune system or the immune response up and down. Uh, perfect. Um, there is a question from uh, Kariman. And actually, this question comes to my mind uh, as well. Now, what's the difference between topical steroids and uh, IV? For example, uh, we say that uh, we must stop topical steroids, but we can give the uh, IV. So uh, yeah. what's the difference in mechanism? Yeah, topical steroids, they act as a local uh, inhibitors to the uh, collagen uh, formation in the wound, which is or the cornea or the uh, stroma. So it uh, inhibits uh, the formation of collagen and uh, the structuring of the stroma locally, topically. Uh, and that's why we don't use uh, steroids if there's an ulcerative keratitis due to an infection. We don't use a steroid infection when it starts because we give it some time to heal and then we kick in some steroids to curb the inflammation. And this is the same thing. Um, the uh, intravenous uh, or the systemic steroids, they work on the systemic immune system. Um, very um, unlikely to reach in high concentrations the area of the, uh, the, the cornea per se, because the cornea is supposed to be a, uh, avascular. So they work mainly on the, uh, the, the immune system of the body, modulating it and just curbing the whole inflammatory response of the body. Um, we don't use it for a long time. That's why I said, because we don't want it to reach the, uh, uh, the corneal uh, uh, tissue. Uh, unless we have a large bore vessel caliber, then uh, it would reach in no way. So uh, the steroids will not be of good value at that time. Okay, I think uh, there is only one last question. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for answering yeah, that one. Thank you. Uh, okay. Now, the last question is, what is the important visual impact of these PUKs uh, in young people? Um, I think she means uh, after healing, maybe. Mm, maybe we can say a regular astigmatism. Yes, definitely astigmatism. If, if, if they um, cause significant guttering, but if they heal, if they, they're in the periphery actually. If they heal well and the cornea retains its sphericity, it does not cause that much of an effect. And even the scarring would not be that noticed, honestly. Um, and patients with uh, PUK. Uh, you'll be amazed how the cornea heals beautifully in patients with PUK if they are just, um, the immune response is just um, stopped. Yeah, actually because of the epithelial masking, uh, yes. because uh, yes. we know that the epithelium has a great capacity to fill the gutter and to yeah. overcome the humps. And uh, so it tries to um, uh, compensate by smoothening the anterior surface of the cornea. Uh, exactly. An amazing capacity of the epithelium. Yeah. And just one minor, minor point to add in these uh, sort yeah. of, especially if we're dealing with vasculitic disorders, please do dilate the eye. Please have a look at the eye. Just not focus on the cornea. This is a medical legal point. Yes, yes. <laughs> this is very important. Look at the patient as a whole and the eye as a whole. Yes, it's very important. I, I always advise... Uh, in my presentations, let's say that uh, we have to deal with the eye as a patient, not as a disease and not as a particular, uh, even with a dry eye patient, uh, how simple it is, but actually it is very sophisticated because the background is the most important to deal with. So uh, we are talking about dry eye. So what if we are talking about a disease? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Very important. Look at the patient as a whole. Uh, hello? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, great. Thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to thank Dr. Nancy uh, for the amazing lecture as usual. Um, we learned uh, a lot of lessons uh, today and I'd like to thank uh, as well Dr. Mohammed for being with us and joining us as a panelist. And uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to thank uh, the audience as well for their uh, very nice questions that uh, uh, let's say, um, make, uh, made uh, uh, mind storming. In addition, uh, I would like to uh, uh, remind you about the coming lecture of Dr. Nancy, which will be just after a couple of days. Um, uh, the, the lecture will be about the chemical burns of the cornea and ocular surface. That will be on Monday, the coming Monday, 5th of October. 
at, at the same time, uh, 6 p.m. Uh, GMT time. So please be with us. And uh, thanks again, Dr. Nancy. Thanks, Dr. Thank Mohammed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Good night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam.